Hello everyone, welcome to uh, video 8-1, this is Mr. Dempsey. In our last video we looked at how bacteria and archaea changed the earth um, through its atmosphere and geology with their me metabolism. In this video we're going to look at uh, something a little more simple and that is how do bacteria reproduce and maintain diversity? Keep in mind that bacteria reproduce asexually, so if we have one bacterium such as this parent cell over on the left, it divides through binary fission to make two daughter cells. However, those two daughter cells are genetically identical to each other and therefore are equally susceptible to any change in their environment such as from an antibiotic. So one way bacteria have evolved around that problem is they've evolved these things called plasmids. Plasmids are uh, extra pieces of genetic information that are outside the major chromosome and those plasmids may contain genetic information that allow the bacterium to have some new capabilities such as antibiotic resistance. So here we have, for example, a bacterium on the left. It has a plasmid. Maybe it gives it antibiotic resistance. It can copy that, uh, the, the plasmid and give it to a recipient cell, allowing both cells to now be resistant. That process is called conjugation, or a swapping, or a copying and trading of genes. Uh, another example of a process that's similar to this is, let's say we have a dead bacterium instead of a living one, and the ba dead bacterium is kind of exploded and its genetic information is oozed out into the environment, including uh, these plasmids here. I'm trying to point to this plasmid. That plasmid then can be absorbed by um, a living bacterium, and so the genetic information that's in the plasmid then can be uh, taken on by that living cell therefore transforming that cell to have the genetic abilities of the dead bacterium. So that is called transformation. Both of these cases, conjugation and transformation, are known as horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer because the information, genetic information, is being passed on across generations from one living organism to another. That's very different from the way eukaryotes typically pass on genetic information which is from one parent to the offspring to the next. So parental F1, F2, that would be vertical transmission. This type of uh, genetic um, passing on is across generations or horizontally or laterally. Next, we're gonna look at how bacteria can be classified based on their shape. Here we have a bacterium on the left known as cocci, kind of a spherical shape bacilli, which are rod-shaped, and spirilli bacteria, which are spiral-shaped. So here are some examples. Here's a streptococcus bacteria. Streptococcus causes strep throat in some certain species of uh, strep streptococcus bacteria do that. Uh, lactobacillus, this forms yogurt. Notice, by the way, in these two types of bacteria, you have the name of the shape uh, as part of its name, coccus bacillus. And also, in this next one, this is not found in the name, but Sprilli bacteria, these cause uh, Lyme disease. And you can see their spiral shape. All right, so now let's imagine we're looking at the tip of this needle. And as we look at the needle, can you identify the shape of these bacteria on that pin or that needle there? So I'll pause. Are you going to pause the computer while you think about that? And if you said bacilli bacteria, you are correct. Next, imagine a scientist or a doctor would like to know more about this bacteria that he or she is studying besides its shape. So back in the 1800s, there was a Danish bacteriologist named, named Hans Christian Graham, and he used a purple uh, stain to, um, to apply to bacteria. And when he did that, he noticed the bacteria were of uh, one of two different colors. So here we have uh, bacterium. Notice that it's kind of this outer shell here. This is called the cell wall. And that upper part of the cell wall contains something called peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan absorbs um, this purplish stain Dr. Graham was using. Underneath the cell wall is the plasma membrane. Um, here we have another bacterium. Its cell wall is much thinner, though, and it's not going to absorb as much of that purple gram stain. Um, and so it's still going to be less purple. So we, if we look over here at this picture, we can see these bacteria are purple. They've absorbed a lot of the gram stain. We could call them gram positive because they've absorbed a lot of that purple gram stain. And they would look like this. 
A lot of uh, thick peptidoglycan wall absorbing a lot of purple gram stain, therefore gram positive. They absorb the stain. Um, these bacteria here in pink have a thinner peptidoglycan cell wall absorbing less of that purple stain and in addition to that have this outer membrane that sort of hides the color slightly so we call them gram negative because they don't absorb as much of the gram stain. But now imagine why do you think this might be useful clinically? So why do you think a hospital will first identify a bacterial infection as gram negative or positive before administering an antibiotic? So uh, pause the computer, think about that. So if you think about it, this outer membrane is sort of like an armor for these bacteria. So antibiotics, such as penicillin, won't be able to uh, make its way into the cell and disrupt the peptidoglycan cell wall, which is what penicillin does. This outer membrane prevents that penicillin from entering the cell and therefore the peptidoglycan is not inhibited by the penicillin. So gram-negative bacteria are resistant to um, certain types of antibiotics like penicillin and so if a patient had a gram-negative infection you would not give them penicillin but some other kind of antibiotic maybe like tetracycline or streptomycin. Finally here we see a rotting lemon and that lemon is being eaten by a type of mold, penicillium. And the mold is actually in an arms race or sort of it com competing with its rival uh, decomposing bacteria. And so these two organisms are um, chemically fighting each other and the penicillium has the upper hand here. It's making an antibiotic known as penicillin. Penicillin is a naturally occurring chemical being secreted by the mold and you can see that it's diffusing into the auger and so this Staphylococcus aureus bacteria is not able to grow around it. There's that zone of inhibition there. Interestingly enough, um, back in ancient times, um, uh, traditional healers in China, for example, would use uh, various molds and kind of press that into a wound. And what they noticed is that it healed the person from um, the, the, the wound and they actually would often survive, which is kind of counterintuitive that you would rub a mold into a wound, but that's what um, people found through trial and error. Uh, it wasn't until much more recently that a person named Alexander Fleming discovered this process and that actually uh, led to what we now think of as antibiotics. Well, thanks for uh, watching this video uh, and uh, I hope you look forward to our next videos in the future. Thank you.